podcast by George. So you'll want to get straight to the show. So you'll want to know what you need to know. You want to know what we're all here for, but well, you better get him. The podcast by George, podcast by George, podcast by George. He knows what he's fighting for. It's podcast by George, podcast by George. Want to know what we're fighting for. Okay, so there we go. We're live. That's uh, Ron Placone, who is one of the contributors to Podcast by George. He does that theme song that we use uh, every once in a while. Hopefully, my audio and everything is working here. I think uh, it is. We've got a special guest coming on by, back on Podcast by George. Today, it's Matthew Ho, and it's because of the situation in Afghanistan. Let's make sure that he can hear us and that everything's working here. All right. Uh, Matt, are you there? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Do I sound okay? Oh, good. Well, I want to bring this up on screen to start with because um, we're going to be talking about the uh, situation in Afghanistan from a worldwide perspective, from a national perspective. But of course, it always comes home and it mm -hmm. came home uh, this morning uh, in uh, the Des Moines Register. I don't know if folks got a chance to see this or not, uh, but uh, it reads. Let's see if this will come up on screen. Um a Marine from Red Oak, Iowa, was killed in the Afghanistan airport bombing. And I don't know, they've got a thing up here with Chuck Grassley. And, of course, I want to remind folks that old Chuckles was involved in this. He was on deck uh, from day one of this thing. He bears responsibility for what's taking place right now, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I want to read this about a 23-year-old Marine who grew up in southwest Iowa. That His family said Friday he was among 13 U.S. service members killed in the deadly bombing at the Kabul airport earlier this week, Corporal Degen William Tyler Page, 23, served in the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, based at Camp Pendleton, California. He died along with 12 other service members, 10 from the Marines, a Navy hospital corpsman, and an Army soldier, when a suicide bomber detonated explosives near the airport gate. As many as 169 Afghans were also killed. Um... And another 18 U.S. service members were also injured. According to the Omaha World Herald, Page's family released the following statement to local news outlets. Our beloved son, Corporal Dagan William Tyler Page, 23, was killed in Afghanistan yesterday. He joined the U.S. Marine Corps after graduating from Millard South High School. He loved the Brotherhood of the Marines and was proud to serve as a member of the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California. His girlfriend Jessica, his mom, dad, stepmom, stepdad, four siblings and grandparents are all mourning the loss of a great son, grandson, and brother. Dagan was raised in Red Oak, Iowa and the Omaha metro area and was a longtime member of the Boy Scouts. He enjoyed playing hockey for Omaha West Side in the Omaha Hockey Club and was a diehard Chicago Blackhawks fan. He loved hunting and spending time outdoors with his dad, as well as being out on the water. He was also an animal lover with a soft spot in his heart uh, for uh, dogs. Well, I, I mean, uh, that's uh, tragic, obviously. Let me bring that down off the screen here um, and see if we can get back to our interview, I, um, it, it's hard to read that almost. Um, and he's a hockey guy and that strikes here, um, uh, home with me. Um, I'm getting feedback here through my headset. I don't know that was me. That, uh, that, that was me. That was me, George. I was trying to, um, share this post on Facebook and I obviously can't do it without setting the whole thing <laughs> off. So. Oh, that, that's all right, pal. Yeah. Cause there was a video <laughs> in that link. I, I appreciate that. But I guess I, what I wanted to underscore there was, Matt, and you and I talked about this in your earlier interview. What we're criticizing and condemning here is the uh, U.S. policy. There are people, yourself included, that went over there with all of best intentions. You know, Tulsi Gabbard was another one uh, that we've talked about on the podcast. Went over there to, to get Al-Qaeda, the people responsible for those uh, Twin Tower bombings. And then when they saw what was going on, like yourself, that uh, formed a different opinion. Um, but uh, these people are not to be criticized. The individual soldiers and this young hockey player from southwestern Iowa. My God, what a tragedy to be killed at this juncture. Yeah, it, it is. It's 
you know, years ago, I, I mean, so, uh, it, and it, it is, it, it, it's, uh, forgive me for not, for not being able to express how I feel right now, because there's a lot of, 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 of sadness, but a heck of a lot of anger. And then I do my best not to curse. Um, this is, um, this is why we advocate against these wars. This is, this is the consequences of fighting, of waging these wars, of invading countries, of occupying countries, of setting up and keeping in power, corrupt, brutal, uh, regimes. Um, this is the consequence. This is not the consequence of uh, not fighting. This is not the consequence of retreating from Afghanistan or ending the war. This is the consequence of waging these wars. Anyone who is arguing any other than that needs to really take a breath and think about what they are saying based upon the last 20 years, if not longer. We could discuss this. It goes back much further than 20 years, but for the sake of, you know, keeping it, uh, you know, for the conversation. Um, this is the result of 20 years of war. This is what it looks like. Young men like this, who God knows what they would have, what he would have done with his life for his family, for his community, right? Um, it, it, it is a great book from the Second World War called With the Old Breed, written by a man named uh, E.B. Sledge. And Sledge was... Uh, uh, a mortar man. He had, you know, he fired mortars for the Marines and he was in, um, uh, 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 the battles of Peleliu in Okinawa. And w one of the best memoirs of war that you could possibly ever read. And Sledge's phrase, you know, uh, just like Kurt Vonnegut in, in, you know, Fahrenheit 451, or I mean, not Fahrenheit, but Slaughterhouse 5, uh, you know, his, his, his use of the phrase, so it goes all the time to speak of atrocity, uh, sledges a phrase to describe the deaths he saw all around him um was what a waste and sledge's point being what a waste what would this young man have done with his life what would he have meant to others what could he have done for others i mean and that's where you look at it you look at um you know the the the, the casualties of these wars and you have to think that uh, you know the casualties on both sides not just the, the Americans, yes. but especially the suffering that the people of these countries have gone through. Uh, when I resigned, I, I, I uh, you know, it, it, I don't point to the resignation letter that often, but people can certainly go read my resignation letter from September 2009 in Afghanistan. And it culminates. It's very clear. My purpose is writing that resignation letter was that these wars are not worth fighting. And because of the effects that these wars have, the the disaster, the catastrophe, the calamity that it brings to so many. Uh, and in particular, when I was writing at the time, um, the notion that I would have to go home to the United States after being in Afghanistan, after being in Iraq twice, and once again have to console uh, the family and friends of people killed there as if their deaths had mattered when they had not. Wow. The idea, and, and then by extension, the idea of what that means in terms of, of uh, you know, the dreams unfulfilled, promises unkept, hopes never realized. Uh, I, I recently had a write. I recently wrote something, George, um, about my decision to this set and how I got there and the process and everything. And, you know, one of the things as I was writing it, I don't think about that too much. I don't like to, I guess. But one of the things as I was writing it, I came across I, in my own thoughts. What I realized about myself was that uh, the, the, the tears that I had on my chest and shoulders from mothers, wives, girlfriends were as devastating as the blood, the, 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 the blood, the brains, the pieces of bone all that I had in my hands during the war, like when I was covered with that stuff. Um, those tears were just as powerful and maybe more powerful to me than that blood and, you know, skin and bone and, you know, tendon, et cetera, was. Uh, in the same way, too, the looks on the faces of fathers, of sons, of brothers, of, of friends, you know, because we're men, we're macho. For the most point, we don't, we, don't, we don't cry in front of others. We don't cry at the funerals or, you know, but... But you still, there's a, um, the, the, with, with the men, the look of, of misapprehension, 
the, 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 the disbelief, the confusion, the blankness that was on their face, uh, that was just maybe more than, you know, what I've seen in a dead face, you know, whether it be a dead American or a dead Iraqi or a dead Afghan, that look in the faces of brothers, fathers, sons, best friends, you know, and, um, and that's going to happen now 13 more times. Um, wow. yeah. I mean, it's and then let alone the 180 some Afghans who were slaughtered. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't uh, get mentioned much. No, it, it's, an, yeah. it's, a, it's an afterthought. Yes. Uh, it's an absolute afterthought. I, yeah. I, I saw something that there was an MSC, MSNB story about this that didn't even mention right. the Afghans killed. I'm not sure if that's true or not. That might just be apocryphal at this point, you yeah. know. Um, but certainly you watch American media coverage and it certainly is 13 Americans killed, blah, 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 blah. And, and at the end of the paragraph, it's almost as an afterthought. X amount of Afghans. Go. Yeah. And the media, I don't know. It, it's kind of weird. And I've talked about it on the podcast uh, before that, uh, you know, all lives matter. Uh, you know, you only have but one life to give. I, dying will ruin your day, folks. Let me tell you something. And to <laughs> underscore uh, Matt's, of, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we tell people to have a nice day and then bomb the shit out of them. I mean, yeah. kill them. I right. mean, that's, that's, how kinda, we, that's how we show we care, George. Yeah, that's by kinda, bombing them. Yeah. It's kind of kind of the uh, American way. But uh, I have this big three on podcast by George that I talk about all the time, and it's climate, uh, war, and health care. We need solutions to those folks. We don't currently have the answer to those issues where might those answers lie they might lie in the ground they might lie with this kid from southwest iowa and the all the other uh, people that have died on both sides in all of these wars which have resulted in nothing good at all and i should have given the proper introduction here just for people that are joining and maybe are not regulars to the podcast that are seeing this live broadcast matthew who knows what he's talking about i want to read this intro that i use and he's got, had over 12 years experience with america's war overseas with the United States Marine Corps, the Department of Defense, and the State Department. Prior to his assignment in Afghanistan, Matthew took part in the American occupation of Iraq, first in 2004-05 and then in 2006-07 as a Marine Corps company commander. So he has experience as a soldier. Again, he's one of those people that went in there with the best of intentions and came out wondering what the hell is going on. He worked with Afghanistan and Iraq war policy and operation issues at the Pentagon and State Department from 2002 to 2008. And then in 2009, Matthew resigned in protest from his post in Afghanistan over the American escalation of the war. And Matt, I know you've watched this on a daily basis. I mean, you've got friends in Afghanistan still. I want to kind of get your insight on that. You've known what's happening over there. These people have been dying on the regular every single day over there, this uh, loss of life. But what's happening now, you saw coming from a long way off and had a lot to do with this decision to step aside because you couldn't undo it, couldn't change it. And you must be in, in, in particular horrified at what we're seeing today. Well, there are a lot of people who... Uh, I just had dinner with a friend of mine who's still involved with it all. He's on the civilian side of all this and uh, very involved with these kinds of things, with these wars, um, very much against them, um, you know, and, uh, and, and involved with them still. Um, you know, and as he said last night, uh, you know, anyone who listens to a half hour podcast on Hellman Province can tell you it was a stupid idea to go into Hellman Province. None of this was, I mean, but the, the problem we have is we have a uh, military and a government that is controlled by institutions and by individuals that seek uh, their own profit and glory. I mean, that's the way it, 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 so much this comes down to. I mean, it might sound oversimplified and there's certainly nuance to it. But when you look at it, why, why did you know when I resigned? So many people agreed with me. When I asked uh, uh, Karen DeYoung, who was the uh, Washington Post reporter who wrote this big story on me for the Post in October of 2009, it's a front page above the fold, 3,000 word biopic, uh, you know, it, it, man, it was like a profile in courage kind of thing, right? I mean, like, um, and I asked Karen, Karen, who was a big deal at the Post, who was an associate editor, she had been Colin Powell's biographer, she traveled with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, I mean, that was her, that was her beat. And um, I asked her, why did you 
put so much of the post capital into me? Why did you do me like this? Validate me like this? I mean, I called the post in 09, October 09, just because I wanted to, I wanted to write an op-ed. That's all I wanted to do. I mean, like, and meanwhile, they wrote this whole big thing about me, big expose and boom, I'm on the Today Show and everything else, right? And I said, why did you do this? And she said, because, you know, I asked, everyone I asked at the State Department, the CIA, the Pentagon, the National Security Council, at the White House, et cetera, et cetera, uh, everyone I asked, um, all of them agreed with what you were saying about Afghanistan. But who else? I mean, like the wars continued. People went on with it. You know, I got I knew the man. I mean, I could we could be here all day talking about all the different people who agreed with me and went along with it. Um, but I, I, I knew the guy who was the political advisor for NATO, the State Department political advisor for NATO. And, you know, in 2009, when General McChrystal's plan to go around to to, to escalate the war in Afghanistan and and, and, and try and win militarily, went around, uh, you know, Brussels, went around NATO headquarters. Nobody agreed with it, Jack told me. He said, but when it came time for the routing sheet to be signed, you know, to check off whether or not you, you agreed and it should be forwarded to the next person, every single person initialed their name. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, and it's, and these are, these are good people. These, these are people with the, with, with the best of intentions, I do believe. Yeah, and they have the golden handcuffs on. But it's also, a, you know, a question as well that um, the institutions themselves are structured in such a way that there is no dissent. There can be no dissent. And the priorities of the institution are what matter. I mean, even in the point that uh, that the president of the United States is boxed in um, there. When I when I resigned, I had to go uh, and forgive me if I've, if I've talked about this on the show before, but um, I had to go meet with uh, the president's intelligence advisory board uh, run by at that point by senators or, or the former senators, Chuck Hagel and David Boren. Um, and, you know, at the, at the president's intelligence advisory board or the PAB, you know, it's exactly that. It's supposed to be, you know, these, these, these outsiders, these wise men and women with experience who kind of look and make sure the president is, is being dutifully served by the intelligence community. And, you know, both Chuck Hagel and David Boren, Chuck Hagel at that point was at Georgetown. David Boren was the president of University of Oklahoma. Um, Boren, they both say to me, how come what you're saying is completely in line with all the Army and Marine and Navy and Air Force officers we have coming through our schools? Um, but yet it's the complete opposite of what is going to the president's desk. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there are some very real systemic things here. And then as well to the personalities. Look, 4% of the American public are psychopaths, right? Psychopaths thrive in institutions. They climb, yeah. I mean, like, so we have to acknowledge that we have psychopaths in power. It, that is not an insult. That is not a, a, an ad hominy. That is not, a, a, you know, a, sl a slur. We have psychopaths in power. People who literally think bombing people is the way to help them. The whole Vietnam, we have to destroy the village to save it. I mean, we have to accept this, that we, this is who we have in power, particularly in institutions that are unaccountable to the people, where it is, uh, uh, um, you know, let's say the Pentagon, the military, or the State Department, CRA, where you climb a ladder. And the best method to climb that ladder is to demonstrate upwards loyalty, loyalty to those above. That's how you get to the top. Um, I mean, so we, I think we have to understand that and recognize that. Um, you know, in order to, to understand why we arrived at these point in these wars, uh, you know, and, and, and what the, what it will look like going forward, because the institutions and the individuals that shape these wars, they have not changed. You know, they're the same people, the same people commenting about how terrible this withdrawal is and sex or are, 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 are the same people who did all these things that brought us to this point, who, who, right? Who are the ones in power who made the decisions yeah. to do the things that resulted in, you know, in, 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 you know, in what's occurring now, including the death of, of, of that young man in Iowa, Dagan. Yeah. Dagan. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I, and the other thing about it is we're elevating these people, not only within the military, but within our political system, within our uh, business and our industries that have this military expertise and what's the primary military expertise killers i mean these people are cold-blooded killers psychopaths a lot of them 
like uh, Matthew says. Now, I'm not talking about that soldier from Southwest Iowa. Yeah, certainly, exactly. but, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want to, if you want to rise up the top. rank, yes, yeah. if you want to be end up making these types of decisions, you have to have a predilection uh, towards being able to kill. And I mean, that's maybe first and foremost. And that leads me to really the first question that I had for you, Matt, with the uh, Marines that are there in uh, Afghanistan right now in Kabul at the airport that are uh, ferrying people that are handling this evacuation. Now, if you interview a Marine, now you were one, I mean, you can reel me in if I'm not right. But I mean, they're killers. I mean, that's what they do. That's what they're kind of proud of, actually. Are is this the are is this the group that should be doing this type of work, um, getting people through the gates on these planes? I mean, they should be providing security, perhaps. But I mean, the administration of this is the Marine well Marine Corps well suited to this. Well, the Marines will do the Marines will do anything you tell them to do. I mean, they they will yeah. absolutely do whatever you tell them to. And we've seen tens of millions of people have seen the videos and the photos of Marines. Um, giving water to Afghan children, holding Afghan babies in their arms. That's but what they're, they, that's what they're, they're also, to do. Yeah. They're also targets. I mean, that's yeah, the other so, part about it. And then, so yeah. that, that uh, ramps it all up. I mean, there's a lot of people who want those guys dead in, yeah. in that country. So if, if they were aid workers from the UN, for instance, that were helping out, well, they don't want those people dead. They want those Marines dead. They get blown up. That's what happened. That's what struck me anyway, when I well, saw the news reporting. I, I think the Islamic State would have, they, they would have killed anyone in that situation. The Islamic yeah. State would have, would have killed, if it was just even all civilian aid workers there, the Islamic State still would have launched the attack because the Islamic State wants the Taliban out of power now. I mean, that's their enemy. Um, mm. You know, there's this, so they, 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 the, uh, but the point about the Marines being killers, you know, you see what the Marines choose to do in terms of holding the babies, drinking the water, you know, providing the, the little kids water. That's what they choose to do. They're still human beings. And one of the things that is fascinating, I think, for people to understand, or, or, or maybe not fascinating, but is a must for people to understand, is that the United States military, particularly the Army and the Marine Corps, doesn't just bring people in and put them in infantry units and they're ready to go. They put them through months, the better part of a year, of, of full-on, 24-7, nonstop, scientifically and academically uh, 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 proven training to condition them to kill. Because we know from past histories, from past wars, that most people will not kill someone they don't know. They don't have a good reason to. You send a young man around the world with a rifle, and he is not going to kill uh, uh, someone else unless his own life is, 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 is directly threatened, right? And even then, he may not pull the trigger. We know this. There are studies done after World War II that showed majority of American riflemen did not fire their weapons in combat, you know, because they don't want to kill. And the same can be said, as we know, from the other side that human, I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. If somebody breaks into your house and, and threatens, you know, yourself or your family, if someone broke in here, threatened my dogs, completely different story. That's self-preservation. That's protection of a loved one. But to send someone around the world to kill, you have to put them through in the Marine Corps case, this young man, De uh, uh, Deegan or Deegan, I mean, again, this, this poor young man in, in Southwest Indiana, uh, an infantryman, a rifleman with, with, with two one, um, you know, he would have been, he would have gone to recruit training for 13 months, right? A boot, boot camp. Then he would have gone to uh, uh, advanced infantry school, uh, which is basically, I think it's about eight weeks long at this point. I mean, so you're talking about four or five months of nothing but being 24 seven in a controlled environment where he is being taught to kill through scientific and academic methods. And that is all he is taught. Mm -hmm. All he is taught is he is conditioned to obey and kill. And then he goes to his unit, in this case, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. And say he only spends four years in the Marine Corps. He will spend his enlistment, the remaining uh, you know, better part of three years he has left, just training to kill. That's it. And that's what you have to do to get these guys to kill. I mean, and to yeah. make sure that they will kill it. They will pull the trigger. And, and it gets worse. Then, then, of course, you have a whole culture of killing that comes into it. You have uh, uh, the, the fantasy about it, the, the, uh, uh, the romance of it. it. You know, you throw in the narratives that you're going over there to protect the American people, which is complete BS. You know, when I was in Iraq in 06, I just recently came across a statistic. Uh, when I was there in 06, 80% of service members in Iraq believed that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and Iraq were involved in 9-11. In mm -hmm. 2006, three years after the war, Four out of five American service members thought that Iraq was involved in 9-11. So you, you pile that on top of that. And they think that they're over there wearing the white hat, protecting yeah. people. But that, I mean, like, they really do. And, you know, they're putting these circumstances 
Um, and I, I think the point being is you get back to the photos of the Marines who were, who were uh, holding the babies, giving the children water, like the, showing what as individuals, the choices they made as individuals, contrast that with the choices our institutions and our leaders have made the last 20 years. I mean, look at what has occurred, uh, you know, th this last um, 20 years in terms of the, the results, the consequences of those choices and, and tell me that we couldn't have done this differently or better. Um, you know, and then, of course, the, kind of the idea where and we've talked about this plenty of times and I'm really grateful, George, we have uh, to talk about veteran suicide. So well, much yeah. of combat veteran suicide has to do with moral injury. That's when and, the, the brainwashing wears off, right? I mean, we talk about everything that makes them into killers, but then when they leave the military, that eventually fades away. And what's left is this PTSD thing that claims more lives than the combat does. Absolutely. And then you, what you have is you have, uh, you know, this realization that you're, no, you're not a hero. You go yeah. to Iraq, you go to Afghanistan thinking you're going to have a white hat on, that you're protecting the American people from Al Qaeda that you are, I saw one thing that this guy killed himself. I was in a discussion years ago on Facebook about three or four years ago with a guy who was adamant that he brought religious freedom to people in Iraq, which is completely <laughs> untrue. Opposite, yeah. opposite completely happened. I mean, yeah. the, the entire Christian and Jewish party of, of Iraq had to flee basically, let alone the minorities and right. everything. I mean, like, um, so, and he, he killed himself a couple years later. Oh my and God. I, well, I have to believe that part of it was because he came to understand and realize that everything he thought about what he did in Iraq, that the violence he took part in, the violence that was inflicted upon him and his friends, that they inflicted upon others, the violence he saw take place on civilians, et cetera, was not for any good purpose, any moral purpose. And then when you go from being that hero to being, um, uh, uh the villain, um, particularly after you've maybe even brought up that way, you watch a lot of John Wayne films, right, right. Right? or now you're watching like the even the Marvel superhero films, right? You know, yeah. you're watching Captain America, it's and huge. Iron Man. yeah, yeah, and that's what you think who you're gonna be, and then you get there, and turns out through your actions, your direct actions, you are not that hero, but then you find out the whole thing was one big lie, and that oh. effect on that is, is yeah, just yeah, uh, this is very destructive. Yeah. And uh, so I got Matt, I promoted this uh, live uh, stream, this live line by podcast by George. And I'm, I've got a lot of questions. I've got some more that I want to ask, but I want to get to some of these sure. that we're getting from our viewers for you. Now, here's the first one. I'm not even going to identify this because this guy, my God, we talk about the news of the day. We've got the Trumpian politics and the QAnon people and people they're looking at him going, what in the hell? I, what are, what's up with those people? We're looking at this pandemic and people refusing to get vaccinated and uh, taking ivermectin, the, you know, the veterinarian grade stuff. Uh, but, uh, we have, um, it's just uh, amazing. Well, I look at this, this uh, question. He says, um, I do not feel sorry for the Afghans. They are a warrior tribal culture. They brought this onto themselves. This person says, I, my God, I don't know how to respond to that almost. Man. We're in their country. Who's the warrior tribal, tribal yeah. culture here? I mean, we're the ones that went in there. Look, and, and that's over there. Look what we did there for a misbegotten reason. Look what we did in Iraq for a lie is a mistake. And if you don't want to look over there, look over here. Look at the history of our own country. We were born in blood, basically, with a revolutionary war. We've the, we're the most warlike tribal nation this world has seen maybe since the Roman Empire. We talked about that even on our last podcast. I mean, I don't know what to do with that kind of thinking. I don't know where to, I don't know how to answer that question. Do you even have a response? I've had a, uh, I'm trying to be um, considerate and patient uh, as I go through these weeks. Um, I find my, it, I find that's difficult, but in this sense, I would ask this person to think seriously about where he gets his information from. Yeah. I had this conversation yesterday on Twitter with, with a young man. And I, I, find, I said, look, I'm serious. I don't mean to be mean. Have you ever read anything about Afghanistan longer than a tweet? And he said, you know what? To be honest, I haven't. Wow. Yeah. Right. And then we got into discussion. I recommended some books. I said, hey, why don't you read these, do this? You know what I mean? So if you're the, the sub and substance of what you think you know about what is going there, is Twitter, is Facebook, is uh, 
two, uh, 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 three minutes. Uh, look, there, a guy named Andrew Tyndall who does like media research and everything. Um, he just he he just published a thing that in 2020, uh, in 14,000 minutes of network nightly news coverage, so the ABC, NBC, CBS nightly news, which is by far where most Americans get their news from. When you look at the numbers for, for yeah. the network nightly news compared to cable news, oh, still, it, yeah. it, yeah. it blows it away. I mean, right. not talking about Maddow and Hannity, but yeah. like this is straight news, blows it away. Um, in 14,000 minutes of total news coverage in 2020, those three networks spoke about Afghanistan a total of five combined minutes. I mean, there were, there were, there have been, I, periods where Afghanistan have not been spoken about in the press for, you know, and then when it is, it's spoken in a team red versus team blue aspect. I mean, certainly that's how you could describe this. Much of the conversation in American media these last few weeks is it's not about the Afghans. It's not about the war. It's about Biden. And how does this decision affect Biden? How does this affect the 2022 midterms? You know, but getting back to this idea that the Afghan people are warlike. No, yeah, they are tribal. That doesn't mean they're not, but they're not warlike. For 40 years under the king, under King Zahir Shah, there was no war in Afghanistan. Were there problems? Yeah. Would it time that the did time that the king have to call out the army to go put somebody down? Yeah. But I mean, like, not in the sense of what we have seen. This notion, and this feeds into the American Empire, into the way the American Empire uh, conducts itself and the way the empire is covered. One of the reasons why the American military people say well the united states have learned from these wars they already have we are the lessons learned are there already the united states military has already chosen the lessons it's learned and its lesson learned is we need to hide these wars so the way we're going to do these wars from now on and you can see this from western coast of africa all the way to pakistan is um uh using special force special operations forces cia and drones because those are all secret not to be talked about no obligation of the government to talk about it. Actually, the obligation is the opposite, to not talk about them because they are secret and classified uh, through contractors because contractors, that's pretty much hidden, and then using proxy forces. And you are using proxy forces, you then have the, um, you then have the, 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 the setup that these people, it's just brown people killing brown people, black people being killing black people. And to the person that asked the questions point, the, the thing is these people have been killing each other forever which is simply not true. The war in Afghanistan, going on for more than 40 years, it is a living legacy of the Cold War. This has got everything to do with the Soviet Union in the United States, not taking agency away from the Afghans, but this has got everything to do with the Soviet Union and the United States in terms of where we are now. One, the one is, is trying to, to, to take advantage of Afghanistan, manipulate it to the point that violence breaks out because of it, and then that violence is further fueled by the United States, to the point the Soviet Union invades, on and on and on, and, and here we are not. Um, that 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 somehow that this is occurring naturally of its own, like spontaneous combustion, is completely untrue. And if you do not understand that, I would very politely suggest that you comment less and read more. <laughs> well, you're being polite, and I, maybe that was a bad first question to start with. But we do have I, this is now this is a very good considered question, and this is from a friend of podcast by George. I know who posed this one, folks. She asks, "I'd like to know more about the differences between the jihadists and tribal groups." I read we armed the mujahideen, but now we speak of Al Qaeda, ISIS K, and Taliban. Do these groups mix in any way over time? How are the mujahideen related to these new groups? So. Go back to the 1970s and understand what's happening in the Middle East, the greater Middle East, the Muslim world. And remember, 78, 79, you have these um, you have these uh, 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 revolutions, these Islamic revolutions, most especially seen through, uh, you know, what occurs in Iran. But also remember, there are existential crises in countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, if people aren't familiar. Go back and look this up. It was it was a, a, a very. Um, uh, very dangerous time for these countries, these governments. Not that these governments were any good, right? But they faced real threats from Islamic revolutionaries. You want to use that? Um, in Afghanistan, the United States and Afghanistan are trying to kind of win uh, the role of of uh, uh, who is going to be the, the, the who, who is going to have Afghanistan under the fold under, you know, wh which color Afghanistan is going to represent on the map. Is it going to be red for the Soviets or blue for the Americans? Um, the Soviets, uh, you know, uh, primarily, particularly after 78, have the upper hand there. 
uh, you have what, what happens is you have a, 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 a revolution in 1978. Uh, the, the socialist prime minister is, is removed from power. Uh, a man that is uh, friendly to the Soviets is, it takes power. He is later deposed by another communist um, that the Soviets don't like. Um, and, you know, so the guy, first guy's name was Tariki. Uh, he gets, he gets uh, usurped by Amin. Amin kills Tariki. The Soviets are upset that Amin killed Tariki. So the Soviets invade uh, Afghanistan December 1979 and kill uh, Amin. Um, literally kick the door of his palace and shoot him in the face. I mean, like, that, 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 that's what they did. I mean, the, the, but you have to also understand, though, that it was occurring at the same time is the United States, six months prior to that, is beginning to arm and fund these Mujahideen groups, these Islamist rebel groups, which really are um, uh, representative of the rural conservative sections of Afghanistan. What you have happening in Afghanistan in the 70s is a modernization effort by these socialist and communist governments. Um, you know, they, want, they want girls to go to school. They want women to be able to work. You know, And this greatly offends the rural traditional uh, areas of Afghanistan, which is most of Afghanistan. Still today, Afghanistan, 75% of the population of Afghanistan is rural. Um, so what you have is basically an urban versus rural, secular versus traditional, religious versus, you know, progressive, you know, kind of tension there that is exploited and, you know, opens up into full warfare that by the time the Soviets do invade in 79, 100,000 Afghans or as many as 100,000 Afghans have already been killed. So July of 79, the United States begins arming and funding these various uh, Islamist groups, these, these groups that are revolting against the communist government um, as a means of trying to bait the Soviet Union into invading, the, into invading Afghanistan. Um, the idea was to lure the Soviet Union into a trap and give them their own Vietnam, which is fairly successful. The other aspect of this plan, which doesn't get spoken about as much, is that the architect of this plan, Zygmunt Brzezinski, um, and, you know, who was Jimmy Carter's now security advisor, uh, wanted to export, cause Islamic revolution in Afghanistan and export that. And remember that the Soviet Union border, the southern borders of, of Soviet Union, where, where its republics were Muslim, or predominantly Muslim, bordered Afghanistan. The idea was that you're going to cause, the U.S. was going to help form an Islamic revolution in Afghanistan. And that Islamic revolution would spread into, as Brzezinski described it, the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. And so remember, go back, you have all this Islamic revolutionary unrest in places like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, allies of the United States. The United States just lost its ally, Iran, when the Shah is overthrown in the Islamic Revolution. And these great, serious thinkers in D.C., Henry Kissinger wannabes, basically, uh, led by Zygmunt Brzezinski, their idea is that we can utilize this Islamic force for our purpose, we can control it, put it into Afghanistan, unleash it, and then that will cause hell for the Soviet Union and help to so help destroy the Soviet Union from within. So you. those ideas that we're somehow going to control, and out of that, the United States starts bringing um, yeah. uh, 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 fighters, Islamic fighters, from the um, uh, from from the Persian Gulf area, from places like Pakistan, other places, into. The, so into Afghanistan in order to help the Mujahideen fight against the communist government, give the Soviet Union its own vi Vietnam, etc. Among that is a core group of, of, of Arab fighters, uh, including a man named Osama bin Laden, who yeah. the American CIA helps bring to Afghanistan or Pakistan. And that core group becomes Al Qaeda. Um, and Al Qaeda, of course, um, we think we can control these people. We think we can use them for our purposes. And no, they had their own purposes. It just so happened that in terms of fighting against the Soviets, it kind of matched up. But, you know, it moves on from there. So that's a long way of explaining yeah. of how this kind of forments. And what you do, you see with like the Islamic State in Khorasan, you know, ISAK, K, Khorasan, for people who don't know what Khorasan is, it, when the Muslim Empire existed, Khorasan was the name for that area of the world, that area that included parts of Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan. And in the tradition, in the end of days tradition, the apocalypse tradition, the, um, uh, the idea was that the Islamic armies would come from the east, come from Khorasan to free 
the Islamic empire once again. So there is, the, there is a lot of tradition and a lot of, of, of identity in Khorasan, this idea of Khorasan um, that you know, goes back to this you know, end of time uh, Islamic apocalyptic visions and you know, understanding it much in the same way as an American thinkers view the continuity of history these people view the continuity of history as, as the Crusades, you know, basically continuity of history from the Crusades, you know, and it's not that simple, but to simplify it for our conversation here. Yeah, so, so there, there is a, 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 a mix, a conflagration. The United States has been involved with these groups. They could try to control these groups. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, a great example of this is in um, uh, Syria in 2011, 2012, uh, at that point, what is known as Al Qaeda in Iraq, which did not exist until the United States invade our, invades Iraq, uh, and, it, and then comes into existence because of the invasion and occupation by the United States, Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, by 2011, 2012, they've basically have been pushed into the western parts of Syria, where the United States decides that we can use groups like this, along with the Saudis, the Turks, the Qataris, the Emiratis, to overthrow the Assad government. And we see this. There, this is proven beyond a doubt. Leaked Defense Intelligence Agency documents. Uh, the uh, people like Barack Obama, Joe, Bi Joe Biden, John Kerry have said this themselves. You know that uh, they always say it as if our allies were doing it and the U.S. wasn't involved. But give me a break. They, 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 they you know, we were we were indirectly supporting them, opposed to the direct support of our allies to these groups. That we were going to use these jihadist groups like the Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which became the Islamic State, or the Al-Qaeda organization, uh, which at the time was called Nusra Front in, in Syria, that we were going to use these groups to overthrow the Assad regime, and that they would not turn around and go west, cross the literal line in the sand, literal line in the sand, right? But that divides Iraq and Syria, and not return back to the country that so many of them come, came from, to refight the war that they had created them. I mean, this is so this idea that we can control these forces, these groups, and utilize them for our own purposes is still there. Um, and so, yeah, it's very complicated. If, if I, I think um, if people want a, a good book to read about this, uh, anything that Scott Horton has read, written, um, uh, Scott Horton, uh, 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 the libertarian Scott Horton, uh, who has written um, uh, the books. Uh, um, uh, enough already and a fool's errand, uh, but also to a book, uh, a man named Ali Soufan, who was a U U.S. FBI agent who wrote a book called The Black Banners. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And George, if you can forgive me for yeah, one go minute, ahead. Uh, I was going to suggest that. Yeah. I, exactly. I, is That's they, right. Go any, ahead. Anybody, anybody out there, does anyone out there want a coon hound? He's about three <laughs> years old. He probably was a deer hound. Uh, yeah. If anyone wants one, I've got one. So please let me know. Give me go, one minute. Go, go ahead. Yeah. And I'll make a point here or two. Uh, you know, what I would say is, and Matt talked about a little bit there, the finger pointing that's going on politically. I mean, if it bleeds, it leads as far as our U.S. media is concerned. And that is the nature of the news coverage that you're seeing. Now, they're dealing with the immediacy of the evac, obviously, but they're also talking about all of this political crap. And both sides are pointing, you know, we only have two sides in this country, basically. Democrats and Republicans are pointing fingers at one another when it comes to Afghanistan. And they're all mutually involved. They're all mutually complicit. And as Matt says, if you read your books, if you look back at history, going all the way back to Jimmy Carter, who has a lot of good qualities. I mean, a great guy in a lot of respects, but I mean, old Zbigniew and yeah. Brzezinski and those guys were involved in this going way back to the early to, to mid 70s. So it's to me, I look at this and I'm shocked at what's happening, but I'm also very frustrated because for me is a big anti-war guy is a big peace, Nick. I'm looking at what's happening in Afghanistan and saying, this is the moment. This is when we can make the point that um, this is what happens with these types of regime change interventionist type wars that we're involved in currently in at least six or seven different places around the world. Let's stop. Let's not do that anymore. Let's finally use this as the silver lining to a very dark cloud to put the brakes on this foreign policy that the United States has been implementing, resulting in this huge loss of life. But maybe most importantly, and I've said this on the podcast before, if you're someone that kind of believes in that, and I don't know why exactly, because it's been proven time and again that it doesn't work. In fact, it actually makes things worse. But if you if you believe in that, let's use this as an excuse right now 
to stop this because of climate catastrophe, the number one institutional polluter in the world, not a country, but the institution is the U.S. military. Uh, the 800 military bases that ring the world uh, currently, huge polluters and huge impacts on the climate with the emission of greenhouse gases and everything that we want to do to try to, to help ourselves survive in this climate catastrophe is going to take time. It's going to take effort. It, I, whether or not it can actually be done in time, I'm becoming a little speculative about folks, but one thing that we could do immediately that would have huge benefit and maybe give us the time to do these other things on a civilian basis would be to close some of these bases, to bring some of this military home, to put those resources, and I'm talking about the actual manpower, if not the equipment itself, to work trying to solve climate crisis in this country with alternative energy sources, solar energy, wind power, and all of these other types of things. So, Matt, it sounds like you were able to take care of the uh, the, the dog. Yeah, yeah, Alex, yeah, he's a good boy. I've had him for about six. He's a, he's a, he was a hunting dog. I mean, yeah. my, my ex and I got into a, a habit of rescuing hunting dogs. We've, oh, we've what did six. you did you catch any of what I was saying there? I mean, do you agree yeah, with I that? Did. I yeah. did. And, and, you know, in the climate, the climate uh, uh, crisis and, and the, the, the say that with the military is such a key thing to talk about, because unless we make these systemic changes, we're, we're really just kidding ourselves. Um, you know, look, uh, um, an F-15 can burn 23,000 gal 23, gallons of fuel in an hour, 23,000 gallons of fuel in an hour in one F-15. If you have a car that gets 25 miles to the gallon, that's going to take you roughly five and a half years to do driving. If you drive a Prius, it's going to take you twice as long, right? I mean, like, so what is, I mean, like, what we're up against in terms of the institutions, the systemic root causes, the foundation of this problem, we have to address, you know, just getting, uh, uh, you know, special light bulbs and, you know, reusable shopping bags. And, you know, I mean, it, that is not going to... Um, um, and that we know that that's been part of the strategy of the fossil fuel company is to make this about individual choices, right? About how like we can reduce our carbon footprints and you know everything else, and that ignores the institutions, right? That ignores the um, you know what the actual uh, uh, building blocks of this crisis are, um, and the same thing with these wars, these same these the same thing with discussion of these wars, talking about this evacuation in Kabul. Uh, and not talking about the previous 20 years or even going further back, you know, to the 70s. And, and even this even like the thing with Afghanistan even predates uh, Carter. There's a lot of good evidence that uh, under the Nixon and Ford administration, um, uh, the United States starts supporting various Islamist groups in Afghanistan because it's a socialist government. Right. So under under a guy named Dawood, a socialist government. So there, there's evidence that goes back to that point. You know, it, as early as 73, the United States CIA is over there monkeying around with people that are just absolutely despicable. One of them was a man named uh, Hek, uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. And Hekmatyar is still in play, still a powerful man, involved with the Taliban now. This guy's a survivor. Where does wow. he get worldwide attention, gains notoriety? Because in the 70s, he supposedly runs around Kabul throwing acid in the faces of women who... Um, are uncovered. This is the kind of man, this is the man that the United States supposedly as early as 1975 starts supporting in Afghanistan. I mean, so the, the point, your point, George, about, yeah, reading the books, understanding the history, we have to know how we got here in order to disassemble it. Because the notion that somehow, again, that the United States has discussed earlier, that we have learned our lesson and is not going to do Afghanistan again, that, it, that doesn't make sense because look at the institutions we have. The institutions we have want to do Afghanistan not just again, but better, right? And the better way to do these wars, as we see now, because there are as many as 15, maybe more wars that U.S. forces are, invade, are engaged in around, you know, throughout the Muslim world, west coast of Africa, all the way to Pakistan, yeah. as many as 15, maybe more. 15, my God. Right? Where, where young Americans yeah. are killing and being killed. We know that... Um, uh, we, we, we know that uh, uh, Americans have been killed in these wars and have not, uh, it has not been reported. The Pentagon has kept it quiet. Uh, you know, you look at the work of like that, a, a guy like Nick Turst does, uh, incredible independent uh, journalist. Um, you know, he's written things for Vice 
uh, and, and other, uh, other, you know, Intercept, you know, where he has done an amazing job of um, uncovering what the U.S. military has been doing uh, in Africa. Uh, and, you know, at one point even, and I'm trying to find it right now because I can't remember the name of the general, um, uh, and I'm not going to be able to find it. But anyway, the general who is in charge of U.S. Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan, and not sorry, in Africa, uh, he says to Nick Terse in, in an interview, he says to Nick, we've taken casualties in these countries, and he lists a bunch of countries, uh, Kenya, Mali, you know, other places. Somalia, um, probably. I don't Somalia, know. Somalia, absolutely. You know, th this was this was after uh, was it 2017 when those four Americans were killed, four those Green Berets were killed in um, Niger, and mm -hmm. nobody knew about it. Even someone like Lindsey Graham, who is you know Senator Lindsey Graham, who's actually a military officer, he's a lawyer in the South Carolina National Guard, um, so he has security clearances. He is also a cheerleader for these wars, one of the biggest. Um, you know, if any, if the military is going to confide in anybody, it would be like someone like Senator Graham, because he's going to say, attaboy, you know, go get him. Yeah. Even this guy like Senator Graham said he had no idea that there were a thousand U.S. military personnel in Niger, let alone that they were engaged in combat. You know, so what, what this general tells, uh, to, tells Nick Terse is that we've done an excellent job keeping these casualties hidden from the American public and the American Congress. Yeah. And that's the lesson that the American military has learned from their wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Yeah. Use these classified secret forces, use contractors because you can't FOIA, uh, 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 you're right, you can't do a Freedom of Information Act on a contractor. That's why, you know, organizations like the CIA, USAID, State Department, and increasingly the Pentagon use private corporations all the time because in order to get information about them, you got to get a U.S. court to subpoena them. And if anyone knows how this all works in terms of having standing, you have to have standing to, to try and get a court to uh, subpoena them, which is impossible because you have to prove to the court somehow that you were involved with, say, say uh, an organization like, uh, and I was just uh, involved in, in some work on this with Mint Press News, an organization like uh, uh, Creative uh, Associates International, who does a lot of work for USAID. They've earned about a billion dollars doing work for USAID in Afghanistan. They also do work for the U.S. government in, in Nicaragua. So Matthew Ho wants to know what this Creative Associates International Organization is doing in Nicaragua. He tries to get a court to do anything about it, to get information on it, because the U.S. government won't provide any information. Creative Associates International isn't going to provide any information. And the U.S. court says to Matthew Ho, hey, what's it to you? What standing do you have? How does this affect you? And so, I mean, you have all these layers of, of, of keeping these wars secret, but then, of course, using the proxy forces. Ah, these brown people have been killing each other forever. These black people have been killing yeah, each other. Yeah, which goes along with that uh, earlier question that we had of people that think like that. And I've got some other questions. I wanted to get to them here. We're starting to run out of time. I, um, I, one set of questions here I wanted to get to uh, because it was directly related to the climate that we were talking about earlier was from the esteemed Stephen W. Schmidt. Right. Stephen W. Schmidt, he's the uh, Lucan Endowed uh, Professor Emeritus from Iowa State University that appears right. on podcast by George all the time. His question. I, I, I am. I'm so. I, I am. I'm totally honored to get a question from Doctor Pollock. Yeah. This is. This is. Yeah. I, I'm well, very. Yeah. I'm very people, grateful. Yeah. Uh, people don't realize that he's not only uh, knowledgeable about politics in Iowa, um, New Hampshire, and uh, America, but. Uh, He's also deeply vested in uh, understanding climate, and he's researched and written on that. And his question here dovetails nicely with that. He says, what impact will the severe drought in many villages in Afghanistan? And I've seen some coverage on this. My God, what will that have on stability, quote unquote, if there is any at all? He says, is it correct that desperate Afghans displaced by crop and livestock collapse due to the drought may be recruited into ISIS and other radical groups more readily, more easily than they might have because uh, they're in danger of perishing because of the drought. And of course, it's all tied to the climate. Yeah, I mean, one thing is it does. In, in their, um, Syria is a good example of this. Um, lots of reasons for why the Syrian war begins. You know, my, my explanation before about the U.S. use of jihadist forces there is one part of the Syrian civil war. I mean, very, so I, I, I hardly ever agree with there ever being only a single or, or, or two or three explanations for something. Usually there's a lot. One of the explanations for the Syrian civil war is exactly this. A drought occurs in Syria, it lasts several years, 
that pushes many rural people into the city, uh, puts strain on the government, um, causes uh, conflict and tension within the society. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, the, uh, people are fighting over resources, et cetera. Uh, so you, you have a, a tension and a desperation that is created within society, right? You're basically drying the tinder, so to speak, for the war to, to be lit aflame, for the, for the country to be lit aflame. Um, and the same for Afghanistan. Afghanistan is an incredibly desperate country. Uh, 40 plus years of war should not surprise anyone that Afghanistan is uh, a completely ruined country. It's the rubble. Only, it, it, it is. The only industry in Afghanistan is narcotics trade. And the only reason that exists is because their Afghan government controlled the narcotics trade, not the Taliban. You know, the, the very people who controlled the narcotics trade before the Taliban took power, the Taliban takes power. They pretty much eradicate the, the, the poppy crops to a point where there's hardly any export of them. Um, we put the men back in power who were in charge of the drug trade before. And these are men, I mean, they, they're well-known names. Uh, uh, Ahmed Wali Kar Karzai, who was Hamid Karzai's half-brother, Muhammad Ada Noor uh, up in the north, uh, uh, Golag Shurzai, Marshal Fahim, a guy named Akin Zada, who was basically kind of best friends with Karzai. These were the men who controlled uh, and until recently controlled the drug trade in Afghanistan, not the Taliban, just another myth, another lie about the war. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you have a country that has no industry. Uh, some crazy percentage of the Afghan GDP is foreign assistance. About 90% of the Afghan government budget comes from 40 foreign assistance. Um, you know, I mean, so you have, if you have this condition where uh, 90% of the Afghan people live on less than $2 a day. 70% of the Afghan people live on less than a dollar a day. So you're talking about the, uh, a super majority of Afghan people living subsistently. A drought, you can imagine what a drought would do when already there are millions of people in, as, who are internal refugees in Afghanistan. You go to Kabul and outside of Kabul, there are these camps of refugees that number in the hundreds of thousands, if not a million people. That yeah. are there who are displaced, not just because of the war, but because of previous droughts, issues with food uh, resources. Uh, you know, and then the other part of it is it makes the, the doctor, uh, uh, the, 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 the doctor's Schmidt. point. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Schmidt, his point, you know, 40 years of war has just demolished the Afghan uh, 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 landscape and infrastructure. You go to Afghanistan and the Soviets in their war, for whatever reason, uh, shows a policy of deforestation, probably because they thought maybe the American Agent Orange program in, something, in Vietnam was something to emulate. But so you see in Afghanistan, there's been massive deforestation, which of course, if you know about deforestation, that leads to water issues. The, the water, um, the Afghans used to utilize these underground networks of, of, of canals, basically, to, to irrigate and to transfer water throughout the country where it was needed. Uh, those, because of 40 years of war, as you can imagine, are destroyed or in disuse or, you know, I mean, uh, need to be repaired. I mean, so there's uh, you have a, a drought and then you package it around everything else that occurs in the calamity. Put it on top of the fact that right now it's unclear whether or not the United States, the Europeans, the World Bank, the IMF, et cetera, et cetera, will um uh, will continue to provide money to the Afghans, the Afghan government. Again, 90% of the Afghan budget comes from foreign assistance. So the collapse that might occur economically because of the lack of foreign assistance, plus the fact that great possibly the Taliban will honor their uh, commitment to eradicating the poppy trade, which would take away the only industry in Afghanistan, the only way millions of Afghans survive, couple that with a drought, and the disaster is, is unreal. Connection to the militant groups is there. We know this. But we also know that people will fight for anyone who offers them money. That's the reason why the Afghan army fell apart. It was an army that was primarily composed of, of men and some women who were fighting for a paycheck. And when that paycheck disappeared over these last few months, because that's what happens when you build a patron network, patron network right? When you have this predatory kleptocracy, when a threat of the money going away suddenly appears, the money stops going out to the people at the bottom. And when those people at the bottom, the, your average Afghan policeman or Afghan foot soldier stop receiving their money, they put down their weapons and they go home. I mean, so you have all this. But the point being I want to get to is what we do know, the main reason why people join and support these insurgencies is because of uh, violence afflicted upon them and their families by foreign forces 
and by the proxy government or proxy forces supported by foreign forces. Uh, we, we know that when I resigned in 2009, someone leaked to the Boston Globe uh, an intelligence report that 90% of the Taliban foot soldiers fought against the United States because they felt they were being occupied, not because of any religious reason, not because of any, you know, they were on some jihadist path, but 90% fought simply because they were occupied. I can tell you the same exact thing occurred in Iraq. 90 for, 95% sure. of the insurgency in Iraq was nationalist opposition against occupation. You know, and the same can be said in Africa. Uh, the United Nations in 2016 or 2017 puts out a big study where they went and they, they met with you know, thousands of members of various militias throughout Africa, Islamist militias, jihadists, as we would call them, comes to be about at least 75 percent of them join these groups because of violence inflicted against their family and friends by foreign forces or by the governments or proxies who are supported by these foreign forces. It's a, it's so a no see, brainer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You see people being I mean, you basically ask yourself yeah. what you would do. Right. There's a video going around that was released of a British soldier executing an unarmed Afghan boy. Um, it, it, you know, just, just shoots him, just shoots a kid, 15 years old, probably shoots him right in the head. It's like right? that Vietnam visual. Of that, yeah. The, and the, the what would you do if foreigners did, did this it. in your neighborhood? Well, what, what would we do, do it in America when the British, you know, were yeah, imposing yeah. their will on the colonies? I mean, honestly, got it. Well, nobody wants an occupying army. Nobody will stand for that type of thing when it comes to their sacred soil. My God, look at how people react here when another political party team bus comes to town or a football right. team or some damn thing. I mean, that I, I, I don't know how you could look at it any other way. Well, um, again, we're running out of time. I, I, you know, my uh, normal podcasts are about 25, 30 minutes in length. And it's because I have to export them and edit them. And that's about <laughs> as long as I want to try to overwork my little computer and hear the live streams. Now, we don't have to do that. But I still think just out of courtesy of our viewers, maybe an hour or so is about the right length. And that's where we're at now. The one big question I wanted to get to here, Matt, before we close, and I've got some other questions from viewers, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get to them. But for you, and you know people personally in Afghanistan from when you were over there still do. Are those people getting out? Are those people going to be able to evacuate? What do you hear coming out of Afghanistan right now? I, I think that the great. Look, the United States military has evacuated as of yesterday. I've not seen the numbers for today. So as we're, we're talking here on Saturday, August 28th. So as of Friday, August 27th in the morning, from what I saw, was 110,000 people had been evacuated by the U.S. Uh, and Western uh, forces out of Kabul. Evacuated from an airport that has basically one functional runway, which if that we can get hold do a whole other podcast on that, George, right? This was an airport that the United States has spent hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars on, and there's only one functional runway. Um, the, uh, right, so they evacuated 110,000 people over the course of what, eight, nine days, uh, uh, via one runway in the center of the capital city held by a victorious enemy. And if anyone knows uh, what Kabul is like, Kabul is basically in a fishbowl. Those hills, I mean, a, a couple of dudes with, with a heavy machine gun, you know, um, in, in the hills could, could shut down Kabul airport in 10 minutes. Uh, you know I mean? So uh, the fact that this is what the U.S. did uh, in this period of time and has done is an amazing success story. And, and if anyone knows me, to, for me to give credit like this, it, this is, it really must be this amazing. Um, you know, so thousands, tens of thousands of Afghans have gotten out. Uh, I have friends who are involved with the effort. Um, I have been involved myself, uh, though not really any other meaningful way than just connecting people, passing emails. But I have seen success stories. I have seen where because the right person got connected with the other another person people were able to get into the uh airport you know I'll give you an example um the uh one group i was working with made contact with polish uh, officials and they were told okay have your people show up at this gate and have them put a big p on their hand and raise the p up in the air and then shout wow. i forget I, I i could look it up whatever they're supposed to shout in polish and that worked same thing too wow. we had another, wow. yeah the, we had one yesterday about 21 mostly girls get out um, they're part of a sports federation, you know, um, and I say we, and again, I'm like hanging on the fridge of these things, you know, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, same thing too. We were able to get a contact with the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian soldiers went out and brought them in. Um, 
So, but I also have other friends that an actual friend of mine, a man I've known for many years now, uh, he and his family um, have not been out, have not gotten out. Uh, they eventually made it to um, the, uh, they have Canadian visas and documents that attest that they are Canadian citizens. And they finally got to a Canadian soldier after, you know, about six days of trying on Tuesday. And at that point, the Canadians had decided, along with most everyone else, from what I could kind of gather at this point, that the only people who were going to be allowed in were, were, were Canadian passport holders. So even though Basir and his family had visas and, and um, uh, documents saying that, you know, we're Canadians, they were not allowed into the airport because uh, they did not have Canadian passports. Basir and his family spent most of the eight of eight days at the uh, gate that was attacked on uh, that was attacked on Thursday. Thank God, thank God that on Wednesday evening, him and his wife decided this is enough, and they went home. And otherwise, they would have been dead. They, the you know, him, his wife, uh, their seventeen-year-old wow. daughter, and their five-year-old son. Wow. I mean, and that's the type of of you know, for the gr- grace of God, that it made that decision. Um, so it is very desperate the situation outside the gates. Besides of besides the threat of suicide bomber attack or other attacks. Uh, you get beaten by the Taliban. You also get beaten by the Afghan security forces. People, a lot, there are two groups controlling the perimeter of the airport. One is the Taliban, and the other are um, what are called zero forces. These are the Afghan intelligence services that are funded by the CIA, still being funded by the CIA. That's why they're out there. These two groups kind of control the out, outer perimeter, um, and the way they control it is shooting their rifles in their air and hitting people with sticks because that's the only crowd control they have. You know, and then you have an inner perimeter, which is controlled by the foreign forces with some support from these two groups as well. That does the actual physical processing of letting people in. Um, it's just a terrible situation. You could have been the worst, um, you know, you could have been the worst suicide bomber in the world. I mean, literally the bad news bears of suicide bombings. Uh, they could have had a success like they had yeah. on Thursday. I, I, I uh, for a year in 2008 to 2009, uh, I led um, a Department of Defense team uh, that worked on suicide bombers. Like we were in charge of trying to find technology to try and protect our troops and as well as civilians and stuff. We worked with Homeland Security and other organizations to try and find technologies that would defend against suicide bombers. The problem you always run up against is you're going to have a crowd. Whatever you do, that you, you're going to have some kind of checkpoint and there's going to be some crowd. And that's what the suicide bombers want. They want a crowd. They don't care about blowing themselves up inside the sure if they had their choice they probably decide to blow up in a, a plane over Kabul for the spectacle of it but the reality is what they want is a crowd they want the most targets possible and anytime you create a checkpoint uh you know some type of choke point some type of throughway, uh you're going to have a crowd there's going to be a queue there's going to be a line people are going to be backed up and that's what you had there in Kabul and um you know, the, the, the situation even aside from that was desperate. You know, you can imagine one, you can get beat up by the CIA forces or by the Taliban. 20 people were killed, you know, in the first few days of it. Some of it from being crushed by the crowd. Some of it shot by foreign forces. Some of it run over by planes or falling off of planes. I mean, the horror of this is unimaginable. But then imagine you were a man like my friend Basir. You were there with your family, your, your, your teenage daughter and your, 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 your five-year-old son. And you're in this crowd of tens of thousands of people. Forget the Taliban, forget ISIS, forget, you know, the CIA forces, whatever. Uh, you know, foreigners with weapons yelling at you and pointing their guns at you. Forget all that. You're just in this crush of people who are desperate. Uh, there's no water. There's no food. There's no bathrooms, obviously. You know, I mean, the, the, the threat of looting, the threat of stealing, the threat of, of, of his daughter, 17-year-old daughter being raped. I mean, the poor man, um, he spent... He slept hardly. He could hardly sleep at all because even without the vestiges of the war, all those things, the horror, the, the shock, the fear that came with just the being in a crowd like that was was, you know, was a, was a hell that I hope no one ever experiences. Um, and the desperation, the fear of getting out. Basi, uh, he was a uh, uh, he is a human rights activist. He has. He is uh, not. He was not a friend to the Afghan government because the Afghan government was brutal in its human rights. Uh, something that was not being spoken about at all. You, George, you and I have spoken about that, right? But yeah. um, something that's not getting uh, talked about at all is just how brutal the Afghan government was with human rights. Um, but 
uh, you know, so not a friend of the Afghan government. Certainly he's not a friend of the Taliban either. Um, you know, I mean, so, you know, this is a man who is very rightly concerned about what's going to happen in the future. And he, unfortunately, right now is 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 uh, will have to find another way out or hope that the Taliban live up to their promises and live up to the promise of of uh, uh, providing amnesty to people and allowing his wife to work and his daughter to continue her school and not be abused and so on and so forth. So it's a really desperate, horrible situation. Well, I encourage everybody to keep uh, tabs on it. I mean, let's watch it here in the short term and let's hope desperately that people like that are able to escape. But then don't forget the long view that I talked about earlier as to uh, how we got in there, why we got in there and not to repeat this and to use it as an opportunity to not do this again. It's not that hard. I got a question here on the uh, uh, comments area, Matt. Um, somebody wanted to know what I thought about Afghanistan. And it kind of goes to the heart of podcast by George, actually. When I started this, I told people, I said, you know, what I think, uh, I'm not that skilled. I'm not that talented. What I think about Afghanistan, as an example, is really not that important. Matthew Ho, people like that, that have been there, done that, that are experienced and knowledgeable. And yeah, that's the kind of people that I bring on the podcast, and that's why I do this. But me personally, just to answer that question very quickly, I'm a once bitten, twice shy kind of guy. I'm once bitten about 20 times shy when it goes back starting in my childhood with the Vietnam War. It's been proven time and again that this does not work. When are we going to stop doing this, and when do we have a better chance than right now when we're actually looking at the end result of it. Let's stop this. Let's undo this. Let's demilitarize and let's do it, as I mentioned earlier, for reasons of climate, if nothing else, because this is all going to come to our doorstep, just like it has the poor put upon people in Syria that we're responsible for. It's coming our way. The climate is changing every day and we need to do that if we're going to save ourselves and save other people around the world. Matt, give us a closer here. We're going to wrap it up uh, for this edition of the podcast by George Liveline. I, I think the point, you know, George, that I take from what you're saying is, is to stay engaged. I mean, stay engaged with things. None of this should be a surprise to people. Like if, if you are following what is occurring um, and which I think people who are watching this podcast are, as well as other events, Nothing that occurs should be a surprise. Yeah, I mean, certainly things are going to occur that you didn't expect or you couldn't see coming. But, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like in a sense that just the other day you were talking with Dr. Schmidt about uh, the guy who ran the uh, Democratic primaries in Iowa in yeah. 2020 getting, getting a job for Troy New Hampshire. Price. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Like, you know, and then the whole thing with Bernie Sanders with like 2016, we clearly see that that primary is rigged. Oh, what a shock. They rigged this one. And now the guy who was in charge of the, the that disaster of a primary in Iowa. Once been twice shy, yeah. Answer. Why are any of us surprised? Yes. Why, if we're paying attention, why are any of us surprised? I mean, I think that's a whole other discussion. We can get into our psychologies and how we grow up and our belief in a just world and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like, yeah, why are we surprised? So the point being is stay engaged. And um, the, the next thing after staying engaged is hold people accountable. We have to hold people accountable. The reason why these things continue to go forward is, yeah, I can't remember if it was the uh, uh, obituary for Donald Rumsfeld back in July or June, whenever he passed away, um, whether it was the obit in the Post and the Times, and I believe it's since been amended. But the mm -hmm. initial obit that yeah. I, one of them published, I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the Post. Yeah. Yeah. Barely said anything about the Iraq war. I mean, had a paragraph on it, but just basically said like he was part, he launched the war. It didn't go that well. And it kind of led to him being pushed out after the 2006 midterms. Nothing about the lies of it. You know, I mean, like in, in the re so if we and people say, well, how come Rumsfeld never repented? Like McNamara did, you know, McNamara, the Secretary of Defense in the Vietnam War, who makes a big Fog of war, yeah, of, yeah repulse, repents and everything. But in the years before his death, is because no one was holding Rumsfeld accountable. He was still living a fat and happy life. He was still probably getting paid fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars for speeches. He was getting put up in five-star hotels. People were, you know, I mean, like, yeah. So uh, if we don't hold people to account, how do I mean? And the same for our political parties. We don't hold our political parties to account. Why do we think they're going to change? So I guess I'll leave it at that.
Well, Rumsfeld was in that four or five percent, that statistic that you cited yeah. as far as psychopaths are concerned. And those people are also populating our political parties from the top down. Matt, you bet I can hear your voice is weakening. I mean, this guy's been doing interviews nonstop since this uh, uh, decision was made. And since uh, this evacuation uh, began, I um, we're going to have to wrap up this um, this edition. And I just want to uh, put a chit out there to bring you back on sometime soon. Of course. Anytime, George. Anytime. Folks, you've been watching uh, Matthew Ho and uh, you've been listening and watching to a special live edition, a podcast by George Liveline. And as I always tell folks, if you like podcasts by George, please, we need subscribers on YouTube. Subscribe there. Ring the notification bell. Even if you're following us on Facebook, that would be a good thing to do. And then, of course, if you're in your car or out and about on your iPhone, subscribe to us on iTunes and you can follow us there also. But, folks, that's going to do it. That's going to wrap it up. That's all there is. And there ain't no more. That's another podcast by George. <laughs>